It is. If you meet the treble on your travels, you'll most likely be going the opposite direction if you do. If you're not going the opposite direction and you meet the treble, something's seriously wrong. But if you are, and when you get to meet the treble, you cross with them. The, you do not have a choice in this. That is what you do. Any other fancy stuff that you might be doing, that happens after you've made, made the cross. And I've just put a few examples up here. The first one is playing Bob Minor, which is as good as playing hunting. And you can see there's two occasions there where it just keeps going, meet the treble, cross over. But if you get to slightly more complicated stuff, um, that's uh, single Oxford, I think. That is double court. Um, you can see there's a few of the fancy little bits and pieces going on. But again, the same rule applies. You see the treble coming to you. You have to make that crossover and then carry on with whatever you're doing. Have a guess what rule two is. Anyone? No. Yeah. You're all correct because there is no rule two. Rule one is the only option. That's your choice. Moving on to treble bob methods. And I've put in brackets, including delight and surprise. And I think I touched on this the last time I was addressing you all. Um, I used to get very confused by what's the treble bob method, what's a delight and what's the surprise. Um, in the same way a square is a rectangle, the surprise method is a treble bob method. So just think of methods as either plain methods or treble bob methods. It's as simple as that. Okay. Now then, with treble bob methods, if you meet the treble in one, two, or three, four, or five, six places, you must dodge with it. You don't have a choice. This is not an option. That's what the treble's going to do. And if you're there, you're the one that dodges with, with the treble. And again, just a few examples. We've got Kent here. You can see the tenor coming off the back there. Maybe not quite knowing what he might be doing when he gets there, but suddenly meets the treble. So you have to do a dodge. Likewise here, um, I think it's London Scholars. Um, meet the treble at the back, you have to dodge. <coughs> Even when you get to really complicated stuff like, uh, I think this is Chester, which has got all this wrong hunting all over the place. You still meet the treble and you still at the top, you still meet the treble and you have to do that dodge. Okay. There is a second rule here though. What do you think might be happening if you meet the treble in two, three or in four, five? Anyone? Crikey, you've all gone cross to sleep already. <laughs> you've got to cross with it, Phil. Exactly. Same, same as in a plane, in a plane method. The, the treble's only going to dodge in one, two, or three, four, or five, six. In the places in between, they're just going straight across. So looking at the same lines there, although in that example there, the treble, the, the treble's dodging with the tenor in, in the three, four there. When it comes to meeting the treble in four, five, you just cross straight over. And again, likewise happened in the um, London Scholars, sorry, Annabelle's London here, and also in the Chester here. Okay, so that's, that's always a good, good thing when you're ringing these things to at least have a good idea where you are. It always helps. There are some methods actually, I thought it's probably worth dropping in these because there are some methods you can ring and whilst you might be frantically looking for where the treble is, it's actually almost unnecessary and even looking like, I'm not saying sort of dismiss it totally, but when you're ringing something like Basto, as you can see, that's an entire playing course there. And there's only this little bit down the front here where you're going to be anywhere near the treble. And that's your lot. And even when you um, then go up to things like Little Bob Minor, <coughs> if, you're, if you're in the back at all, there is no danger of you ever meeting the treble unless the treble's gone seriously wrong, in which case you can, you can tell them. Okay. It's, it's actually more apparent with Little Bob when you get into higher numbers as well. <coughs> that's, that's just two leads of Little Bob Maximus. I, I thought about doing Basto, but the chance of you ever ringing Basto Maximus is pretty non-existent. <coughs> but certainly even with Little Bob, there's two of these there, as you can see, the treble is absolutely miles away from what's happening on the blue line here. And that, that is true of most of the playing calls. But it's, uh, it's handy once you know, get to know when you're at least getting down this end of things and keep an eye out. Okay, how are we doing so far? Any questions? Right. Good so far, thank you. All good so far, right. 
just a, a little bit on Bob Doubles, isn't it, as, as, um, as a starting point. The general means of getting into, into ringing Bob Doubles is to learn this circle of work that you, hear, that, that you see here, the sequence of the dodgers and making long fifths and making seconds. Something which I, I might be wrong, but I don't feel we see quite as much of these days. I'm not saying that's a good thing or a bad thing, but this was also sometimes drummed into people as a means of learning the method. And it's all related to where you pass the treble. You know, it says starting from these. So if you pass the treble in four five, then you would dodge three four down. But personally, even I would find this quite bog quite mind boggling to uh, to try and get a grip with. I think the idea of learning a circular work is is probably easier. But I'm really bringing this in because of the, the relevance of you know you need to know where the treble is if you're going to be doing this. When you move up to Bob Minor, you can do exactly the same thing again. You can have this circle of work, which if you think about it, it's got one extra thing in to do. Likewise, if you put in the same chart of work for learning where you pass the treble, there's now an extra line in here. Um, personally, I feel that starts to get a bit much. Um, in, in doing a bit of Googling, prior to today. I even found examples where there was people writing articles on how to learn play Bob Major and they did exactly that same thing. They had this list of passing the treble is five, passing the treble is five. and it was, it was quite a mind-boggling list. Hang on, hang on. Somebody got a phone going off or something. Yeah, thank you. Thanks, thanks um, Eileen. Um, And what, what I found quite interesting, I thought, well, if somebody said to me, ringing Bob Major, I'm passing the treble in six, seven, what do I do? I wouldn't have a clue. I could probably work it out. But I don't necessarily think it's essential to learn this sort of thing. But, you know, some people ring it that way. However, I'm now going to sort of chat a little bit about me, or more importantly, about how I got to learn Bob Minor. Um, and it was quite simply <coughs> from lead, count the bells before meeting the treble, count the same number after the treble, then dodge. I'll come on to a bit more of this in a little bit. But just to give you some examples, if you look at that first lead there, I've put some rings around the bells that the number six is passing as it comes off the front. And you can see that it passes the five and three before it meets the treble. So there's the two bells it's crossed, it's passed, it meets the treble. So it then passes the same number again afterwards, the two and the four. Mm. And then he says, right, I need to dodge. And quite simply, you just go one step back in the opposite direction to which you're going. And the same thing, that's for an up dodge. The same thing works for down dodges. If you look in the, the fourth lead here, you can see how the bell has gone <coughs> one, two, three, four bells, and then the treble. One, two, three, four dodge. So he then just takes a step back. The only other thing to bear in mind is when turned from the lead by the treble and you make seconds, but you could argue it's the same basic pattern. If you've met no bells before you meet the treble, you don't pass any bells afterwards either. So technically that's the same as making seconds. And that, that, that's how I started ringing Bob Minor. As I say, I'll come into a little bit of detail on the next page. <coughs> It's worth remembering though that whilst this may enable a learner to get through a course of the method, it certainly is not recommended for the longer term. It works provided that everyone in the band stays right. Should any of the band go astray, the ringing will most likely as not head south pretty quickly. To be able to ring this confidently or any method for that matter, there is a need to at least have a good idea as to where the treble is passed, like a road sign. Now, I'm going to confess here, and some people might cringe at what I'm about to say, but I think it's probably just worth putting out there once. It might, it might seem strange, but although at the time I was only able to ring grounds for doubles, this, this way of ringing playing Bob Minor was suggested to me by my then local tower captain, 
and he couldn't even ring the method. Just just imagine the scene. There's me, I'm sort of 15, 16, and I ring in a towel with six old blokes who all wore jackets, ties and waistcoats, and they just rang grandson doubles. They couldn't ring anything else, and they <coughs> rang grandson doubles by numbers, okay? And even learning grandson, I can honestly say I don't recall being shown a blue line or, any, or the circle of work or anything like that. It was literally just the dentistry approach. I was told to grab old and fill the gaps in, and that's how I got grandson doubles. Um, I was keen to start getting out and doing other things, and I'd heard this Bob Miner talked about. And it's the local tower captain who said, well, I heard. He said, if you count the bells before the treble and the same again afterwards, and then dodge. And so as I got out and about around other towers, and particularly Shropshire Association meetings, which were very easy for me to get to because I lived on the train line out that way, um, you know, it, it worked. That's the thing. Visiting other towers, I could get through a, a plain course quite unscathed, initially quite oblivious to the order in which I was passing any of the other bells or indeed anything else that might be happening, as in when the dodges were happening or the sequence of events or anything like that. But having done this only a few times, I quickly discovered two things. Except for the treble, I was passing the other bells in the same order. Let's just say, for example, I'd grabbed hold of the second. By the end of the playing course, I'd worked out, in fact, the fourth turn from lead every time, except that one time when the treble did. So that sort of went into the memory. And the other thing I noticed was that the number of bells passed before meeting the treble reduced by a factor of one every lead. Now, all of a sudden, that gave me a couple of building blocks. because <coughs> I wasn't sort of looking all around the place as to where, you know, what, what I might be doing next. I knew who was going to turn me from lead. I know... I knew who I would be following next, but I also knew where in that sequence I was going to hit the treble. And it's because of this second point I was able to work out, if you can call it that, it's not rocket science, when I was going to pass the treble before I got there. Now this was quite handy, because it didn't matter quite so much if the treble was in fact in the wrong place. I, could, I knew where I would have crossed paths, and as such, I was able to execute the following dodge in the correct place. A further benefit I realised was that when it came to ringing, it was when it came to ringing touches. Managing the bobs and singles was easy enough, partly because I wasn't worrying about what I'd be doing at the following lead. Um, and just, just digressing slightly, I thought I'd drop that in, actually, because I do find occasionally I'm chatting to people about what to do at bobs and singles in particular touches. And I start explaining what you do at the bobs and singles. And they say, no, I know that bit. It's what I do at the next lead end. And I think, well, that's not the bob or the single. That's something separate. So I didn't need to worry about that. Once I'd, once I'd executed the bob or the single, whatever it was, I simply counted my bells before the treble again. And that was my cue and it dropped me back into place. And eventually with time, this whole thing just became automatic. You do it on autopilot. It's, it's a bit like, you know, when you drive home from work or, or, you know, you've just got back in the supermarket. Do you actually remember how you drove the car from Tesco's back home? If you analyse it, it's largely automatic. You might remember some of the scenery along the way, but actually physically driving the car, you won't think about it. You just do it. So all these observations became planted in my brain and before too long I was ringing plain Bob Minor competently on autopilot. It, and it, it is difficult to explain how but it's more a case of getting to know for example what a 3-4 down dodge feels like or on those occasions when my mind might have strayed off a bit you know it, it, it used to happen and of course it still does. I'd be able to see quickly where the treble, treble was and instinctively take my cue from that. Any questions on that so far? No. <clears throat> A great audience. So back to the plot. What I did learn from this experience as well was that even though initially I had no idea where the treble passing points were, knowing where the treble will or should be does make things a lot easier. As you will have noticed, and as you will have been um, noticed during recent presentations, there's a lot of commonality between some methods and as such, the same is true where the treble is passed. Um, I've, I've talked on more than one occasion of methods where you get 
two bells triple dodging either in one two places at the front or in five six places at the back but not only is the blue line common to both so is the point where the treble is passed so that can be a very handy cue and i've got another another couple of examples here if you see on the left here that's a three four up dodge followed by fourths now that could actually be playing bob minimus or it could be single oxford minor one's a four bell method one's a six bell method not only is the blue line identical, but those two points where the treble is passed are exactly the same in both methods. And also in double, um, double Oxford or double court, they both have these places in the middle of the, in the two quarters of the lead end, I should say, one in each half. And as you can see, you do in this instance thirds the treble comes through and that's followed by fourth and it doesn't matter which of those methods you're ringing there's probably other methods beyond those as well where you'll see places like that and it will be quite often to let the treble through Bill? yeah um well this this has made me think that um one one example we can uh put out there is that in plain bob doubles if people do know where they pass the treble so so, so that's where uh, that's the method most people are going to be starting off with. Mm -hmm. So if you know that you make seconds when you pass the treble in seconds place, um, and if you know that when you pass the treble in three uh, in three four, you're going to dodge three four up, um, mm -hmm. then then uh, that actually all translates to some of the doubles variations. So something like Saint Simon's, mm -hmm. you you do you're dodging three four up when you pass the treble as you leave the front. So you you're in uh, in uh, third place and pass the treble. So you dodge three four up. So what it does, it just but but in those in, in a method like Saint Simon's and those doubles variations, it actually just puts the dodges the dodges come in a different order. So. Uh, but, but knowing that you're going to dodge in three, four or up because you pass the treble in third, then becomes a very useful signpost. Mm -hmm. So if you pass the treble in, in fourth place, then you're going to make long fifths. That's yeah. the same in all of those doubles variations as well. So, uh, so just a point there that might uh, help to illustrate it. I, I was going to touch on that, actually, because... Sorry. No, no, it's quite okay. I'm glad you, I'm glad you did. Because the, the other thing, or another way of putting it, is if you're ringing St. Simon's, and the treble is the treble is nearer to the front of the method than you are, or nearer to the front of the change than you are. At that point, you're actually ringing playing Bob. You're not ringing it in the same order. But St. Simon's is playing Bob, but it's it, you do something different if you are below the treble, as in once the treble is behind you, you do something different. But if the treble is below you, it is in fact straight playing Bob doubles. Just comes at you in a different order. But no, thank you very much for making that point, Claire. Thank you very much indeed. So initially, just trying to sort of summon all this lot up um, in, into some format, which might be helpful. So initially, I thought when, when tackling a new or an, or an unfamiliar method, it may be an, an OK idea to think of learning it in three stages. And I know some of this might look a bit blunt, but I think it, you know, trying to keep things short. Ring the method for the first time and maybe not having a clue as to where the treble might be. That, that would be a worst case scenario, but so certain methods, they're simple enough, you can do that, okay? But with experience, getting better at the method and then being able to work out in advance where the treble might be, again, that doesn't mean to say you have to be precise, but you might think, yes, I'm gonna, I'm gonna meet the treble somewhere at the back, so I don't need to worry about it if, if I'm down at the front. Ring with confidence and so knowing exactly where the treble will be whether it is or not. And it's just something which, as I was trying to say, that it just evolves and just, just turns into an autopilot means of ringing. And the other little thing I did just put at the end, whoops. I thought I'd got another line somewhere. I know what it was, I think actually the previous page, I think I skipped one line. I did actually point out that the means of, of um, counting bells before the treble and the same again afterwards, it does work for odd doubles methods as well. As long as you remember that, that if you're ringing Bob doubles, it's if you pass two bells in the treble, you're not gonna do a dodge two bells later, but you will do something two blows later and it'll actually be made fifths. On triples, it's if you pass three bells in the treble, so on and so forth. So it does still generally work, but you've got that extra clause in there to remember. Okay. 
So, moving on. Now, I, I, I put double court in because, I, I, as Keith knows, and a few others out there, I'm, I'm, I'm very good at mentioning methods. And when someone says, how do I ring it? And I just say, oh, well, keep an eye out for the treble and you'll do this, that and the other. So I thought, well, I can, I can use that as an example here, but also show where you can take this treble knowledge a little bit further as well. Now, it's a double method. It's, the, the clue is in the name. It is a double method. Uh, which basically means you can turn it upside down or look at it left to right. It's exactly the same line. It's not going to make a scrap of difference. But one thing you'll know automatically is that whatever happens in one, two also happens in five, six. And the very simple basic rules for, for ringing this, if you want to do it the quick way, you can, I mean, you can learn the line if you want to. You can learn the line if you want to. But if you get to the front, always dodge. If you get to the front or the back, always dodge in one, two and in five, six, unless the treble is there. And even those last few words are almost unnecessary. I've said, unless the treble is there, that should also be an automatic process. You might get to the back, the treble's there. Well, you can't dodge with it. So, so that, that, that decision is made for you. From a dodge in one, two, you always go to a dodge in five, six and vice versa. So that's straightforward enough. If the treble turns you from the front or the back, then make places in three, four, beginning with the farthest. So that's fourth from the front or thirds from the back. Hence here, if you look at the end of the first lead there, as that bell's coming off lead, the treble's turn. So they do the far place first, which is fourth, followed by the thirds. And the reverse is true coming off the back a bit further down the page. The treble turns you at the back, so you do the far place first, then the near, and carry on. It's worth also just mentioning, this is just a smaller side. Those places are right places. They'll be at hand stroke and back stroke. So they will, they will feel right, if you know what I mean. If you try doing them the other way around, try coming off the front and doing thirds first. That'll be back stroke and hand stroke, and it'll feel strange. So that can also be a bit of a cue for you. But even that, that little list of instructions there, I've seen simplified, quite simply, dodge to a dodge, place to a place. There you are, Keith. <laughs> Can you remember that, Keith? Yes. <laughs> yes. I just, I'd spotted that just before you put it up. <laughs> <laughs> this is what we were going to ring at Mosley before it got cancelled. Yeah. Okay. Well, that's, that's all well and good, and it does work. And, uh, you know, even, even I tend to ring it that way most of the time. But at least there's a few other things which become a little bit automatic with it. Once some confidence has been gained ringing this particular method, it's worth noting that when moving between the dodgers at the front and the back, the treble is passed somewhere in between, thus making it impossible to meet the treble when you get to the other end. So again, you can see at the start there, the tenor starts with a dodge in five, six, and very quickly passes the treble. So already, even before you've got to the front, you're thinking, well, that's great, that's out of the way, and no, I'm going to be doing the dodge when I get there. Similarly, if the treble turns you from, say, the front, which again is this little bit here, the treble will be your after bell. Now, Tony was talking about after bells and course bells going back a few weeks, and I must admit, even I learned something on that. So you start heading off to the back, and the treble starts following you, but you're only going to go as far as fourths and make a place, technically, as if you're ringing the method on four bells or playing Bob Minimus, something like that. So the treble is then going to catch you up and want to cross over with you where you make another place. You then become the after bell of the treble, which tells you straight away that you keep going. You're going to meet the treble when you get to the back. So already when having passed the treble there and set off again, you should be able to work out. Actually, you know, you're going to meet the treble when you get to the back. It's not going to be something you discover as soon as you get there. And the reverse is also true going the other way as well. Any questions on that so far? No, that's the same question. I'm doing well, yeah, doing well. Right, moving on a little bit. This, where we go from here, we're probably sort of starting to look at slightly more complicated stuff. But as I said at the, at the top of the page here, what, what follows, it's not about learning Cambridge Minor, but it's more a case of just trying to illustrate how when learning methods, like, well, Cambridge in this particular instance, 
knowing where the treble is can be a great help. And I will just add as well, although I was saying, you know, learning playing Bob with some of the other simple stuff, it's not essential that you learn where you pass the treble straight from the off. Um, it is certainly more so recommended when you're starting to get to the level of Cambridge. But provided that you've got a good, you know, a good, good handful of methods under your belt that you can ring well before you get to Cambridge, it will be less of an issue for you. It, it will it will happen more easily. So don't don't fret about Cambridge yet. If you, you know if you're still on the plain bob level, you can you know don't worry about what happens when you get to Cambridge. But just I'm not going to look at the whole method either. I'm just going to look at what is generally known as Cambridge places. You might hear that yelled across the ringing room at someone who's floundering doing Cambridge places because not only do they appear in Cambridge, they appear in other methods as well. And it doesn't matter if you're ringing. Um, uh, Yorkshire or Lincolnshire, they're still called Cambridge places, they're not called Lincolnshire places or anything like that. These can basically be thought of as a triple dodge with dodges two and four substituted for places and they look like that. That is just one set of Cambridge places. Now I said they're basically five dodges and you can you can do this like that. There's your first dodge, that would be a second dodge, that would be a third dodge, that would be a fourth dodge, sort of gone a bit astray there and the fifth one down on the end there okay and that's what they look like in if you're ringing minor on six these only ever occur in three four places they don't appear anywhere else at all they are purely in three four but on higher numbers they can be found in five six seven eight and so on but never in one two you never see them in the, at the front in one two and you'll never get them in the farthest places whatever that might be. So if you're ringing on 10 bells, for example, you're ringing Cambridge Royal, you will not find these places in 9, 10. You will only find them in 3, 4, 5, 6, and 7, 8. Okay. There's a unique feature of these places, which is where we're getting to, is that the dodge in the middle is always with the treble. You can see the red line of the treble dodging with the tenor there. It happens every time without fail. And this is true for any number of bells and as such is extremely handy for those occasions when a ringer may be trying to execute these places but not quite in the right place particularly when you start getting into higher numbers um, you know if, 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 if you're a bit less experienced on, on, on eight or ten you will find yourself loosely in the right place but you sort of flounder a bit you, you think well I'm, I'm not meant to be doing five six places I'm sort of here but all of a sudden the treble will pop up and there you are, you can do that middle dodge with the treble and it'll help cement you in the right place. Like the dodges, there are up places and down places, and any dodges made during these places are with bells coming from the opposite direction. Mm -hmm. So the examples shown are up places because as you can see, number six there was coming from the front, so it's going up to the back. It's just gonna take him an awful long time to get there because he's gotta do all this lot first, okay? And these are up places and the treble, as well as the other bells dodging at the start and the end, are performing down dodges. There is a further feature which is unique to Cambridge Minor only. And it's that this, the, the dodge at one end of the places is the lead end dodge and the dodge at the other end is the half lead dodge. Two very important places when knowing where the treble is can be very, very useful indeed. Quite simply, if it's the lead end dodge, you know that's where you're going to be picking up a new play spell. And if it's the half lead, it's because you know, well, I'm either just finishing my places or I'm just going to be starting them. And I've just done another chart which basically shows these in a bit, in a bit, more, bit more breakdown. On the one side, we've got the up places. On the other side, we've got the down places. Whereas the first dodge with the up places is a half lead dodge, for the down places, it's a lead end dodge. The dodge in the middle is with the treble, that makes no difference either way. And then when you get to the bottom there, for the up places, you then get to the lead end dodge, that's where you suddenly become fourth place bell. Sorry, third place bell, do apologize. And the half, and, and the half lead dodge at the bottom end of the down places. But at least there's three points. You know the treble is in the middle, and you know where the treble is. 
at each end. Okay. Just to help as well with a bit of understanding, I thought I'd put this grid here on the on the right hand side. It, it's 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 not often thought about, and I do find it can be quite helpful. That is basically one lead end or one lead, 24 rows of Cambridge Prize Minor. And if you look at the line in black, that is fourth place bell doing its places, dodging with the treble in the middle, then the more then more places, and then finishing with a three, four down dodge before carrying on down to lead. Okay. But when it does this last three, four dodge, which you can see is at the half lead, there's the treble on the back. The bell that's come up to do that dodge is then starting their up places. Again, meeting the treble and finishing off. Now you see this bell that's come off the back to dodge in three, four. What do you think they're about to do? Anyone? Keith? Well, let me give you a clue. If you look all the way through the lead end of Cambridge minor, there is a bell making Cambridge places. That's it in the first half and that's it in the second half. There is, there is no point in Cambridge minor. There is not a point in Cambridge minor where somebody isn't doing their three, four places. So if, if, you're, if you're dodging in three, four at all, you must be doing your places. So this bell has just come off the back. Where are we? That, that green line has just come off the back and he's doing the three, four dodge. So what is he about to do? Down places. He's going to start doing his three, four places down. Which is when you can also start being clever, because if you're, if you're doing the line of the blue bell, this is just a for example, that bell comes off the back and misses a dodger. You can say three, four dodge, you're just starting your, you're just starting your, your down places. But I think, crikey, he's a clever ringer, he can put me right. So something worth bearing in mind there as well. Any questions on that so far? <clears throat> the last the last couple of pages really for, uh, are for a bit of fun more than anything else just a bit of light relief um i put london surprise minor which is really quite scary stuff um the the, the thing about ringing london I don't know, have any of you seen that that um that that text you, you see and it's explaining cricket to a foreigner um, it's really quite complicated. The team that's the team that's in goes out, and when they're out there, the other team that's out goes in. It's all very confusing. And ringing London is a bit like that. It, it goes against the grain of everything you will have learned up to the point you start looking at this. Um, but basically, despite the treble bob hunting, which is done by the treble, now it's, it's worth bearing in mind that is still an ordinary right hunting bell, just like ringing plain bob minor. All the hunting in there is right hunting. The leads are all handstroke followed by backstroke. The blows at the back are all handstroke followed by backstroke. And ringing the treble to treble bob is exactly that. The treble is still doing perfectly ordinary right hunting treble bobbing. It doesn't change. However, all the other bells go the wrong way. And it's a bit like you're trying to drive forward down a motorway doing your path of work, but every other vehicle is not driving it in the opposite direction. They're reversing towards you, all of them. And they've got to make, that. they've got to take evasive action to make sure they don't hit you. So collisions will happen unless, ev unless evasive action is taken. And in the diagram above, it can be seen that bells which are hunting the wrong way often make a place or some of the maneuver to put them right again, as in to make them right hunt, to avoid hitting the treble, so then afterwards make another place or whatever to put themselves wrong again, which is right. Now, just to try and explain that, if you look at the very start of the method there, you've got the first row there looking at the tenor. If that was, if that was a right place method, the tenor would at least go into fifth place. After that, they might dodge back into sixth or they might carry on into fourth place and so on. But that would be if it was a right place method, but it doesn't. It starts by making a wrong place in six. And that, that basically messes things up immediately. He's also helped by the third, which is also making a place, which wouldn't be a problem if the third was gonna go forward, but he's not, he's gonna go backwards. 
but again on the wrong stroke. So the, the, the tenor's technically on the wrong stroke, but he's right because he's ringing London. And so he wrong hunts. I'm just going to change the point of this because I keep losing my mouse. He comes in three blows and he wrong hunts. Now, as you can probably see from that, if he doesn't do something, he's actually going to hit the treble in third place. So he has to make a place to put himself right again. Ah, that's handy, that fits. So we can now dodge with the treble, that's okay. Ah, but we're ringing London here, so go make another place to put himself wrong. He hunts down to lead, still wrong. He's still hunting out here. And again, the same thing would happen. He's about to pass the treble. And if he keeps going on his trajectory, he's gonna literally crash the treble in fifth place. The idea is you cross over in the gaps in between. So he has to make a place, then cross the treble. Now he doesn't make a place straight afterwards in this instance, because technically he can't. If he was to make a place there, it would mean the two would have three blows on the back. So he's gonna be a little bit obliging and he's going to do a dodge. Well, almost a complete dodge, because by just doing a point there and not lying, then that means he is then wrong hunting again as he comes off the back. <coughs> wrong places and then wrong hunt out again. I'll spare you the rest of the method, but the whole thing goes like that. And it would be an interesting exercise actually just to look at the line for London without anything else in there at all. No path of the treble or anything. Um, you could probably work out quite easily, rough, or very roughly, where the treble passing points are because you'd see it every time that those little those little bits where they might be right hunting is where they have to pass the treble. Very, very popular method, London, particularly on high numbers. It's very, very musical and it's great fun, but boy, can it go wrong quickly for that for exactly that reason. Something that goes against the grain. Any question any questions on that? I'm gonna say, Phil, therefore it's important to get the treble absolutely spot on in London. Exactly. You have hit the nail on the head, Alan. Absolutely. I would definitely say if somebody came to me and said, could I try London Minor? And I say, OK, have you learned where you passed the treble? And they said, no, I think my answer would be the same. Well, in that case, no, you can't. It, it, yeah. You're just not going to get anywhere. Mm. You will be all over the shop. OK, but this is this is advanced stuff. And as I say, I put this in just more for the fun of it than anything else. OK. Let's lose my pointer. So, Phil, similarly, um, yeah. the treble's not somewhere to put someone who's learning method ringing. Uh, also, you know, it's, it's tempting to put somebody on the treble who's not able to ring a method, but you're probably causing yourself more problems than you're solving yeah. by doing that. I mean, let's put it this way. As long as they were, as long as they were confident in K, ringing the treble to Cambridge and other stuff like that, it wouldn't really matter if they weren't a method ringer. But certainly if they were learning treble, Bob, I certainly wouldn't put them on, onto London. You know, yeah. there, might, there might be some that would manage it, but you're always going to be safe with, with a more right method. You know, it, and, and as well, you see, the, the music of Cambridge is more familiar with, 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 than London as well. But, uh, but oh, terrific fun, terrific fun. Anyway, just, just as a final page, and again, this is, this is a bit of fun. This is something, I, I haven't done much of this recently. I used to do a lot of this on ringing holidays and things that I went on. But once, once methods are, sufficient, are, are known sufficiently well, there's a whole, whole new catalogue of stuff you can ring by gluing known methods together. And this is, this is just a classic example of, of where people start doing this sort of stuff. This particular method here is Oswald Delight Minor. And like any method, it can, if you wish to, you can, you can ring it having learnt the blue line. However, if you've got to the level of ringing whereby you are capable of learning the blue line for this, you probably already know Cambridge Minor, and you can probably ring Kent Treble Bob as well. If you can do that, that's all Oswald is. And if you, for example, looking at the first lead here, if you see this bit of blue line, which there's a dodge with a the treble there in three, four, that bit of line I'm drawing a pointer over down to that front bit up to there all that is work which is below the treble okay can you understand that you're this you're to the you're to the left of the treble well that is actually cambridge between those points from there down to there that bell is ringing cambridge in fact that those places might look familiar as the bottom half 
at Cambridge Places, which is exactly what they are. Hmm. So what do you do when you cross the treble? I'm going to put the laser thing back on again. So what do you do when you pass the treble? You have to flick a switch in your brain and suddenly say, Kent. You're ringing Kent. And that point on, you are ringing Kent. You might recognise the three, four places of Kent there and the treble bob on the back. And you keep ringing away, Kent. And you suddenly think, ah, pass the treble again. Switch, put the switch back over and back into Cambridge. So that is exactly Cambridge front work. If you can get into things like that, there is a raft of methods out there you can ring by literally just knowing a handful of methods. My own, my own personal example, there are only three surprise minor methods I can remember. That's Cambridge, London and Norwich. Um, and then Kent and Oxford treble bob. I don't really know any others at all. Um, but just knowing those five, you can ring, I think it's about 30 or 40 methods just by knowing those five. It's really quite, uh, it's really quite extensive. The, the two points that catch people out with this, it's worth, just worth mentioning is they're doing the Cambridge front work here. They dodge with the treble at the end and then they try making seconds as you would if you were ringing Cambridge. But of course you're not, you're above the treble, you're ringing Kent, so you run out to third place bell. And the reverse is true when they do this work on the back here. They, they sort of slip into, um, they sort of run, come, come, off the back, come off the back, think I'm ringing Kent and keep going forward. But of course you're not, you're below the treble here. So you're ringing Cambridge, so you make fifths and go back out again. But there's loads of, there's loads of those out there. Absolutely loads of them. And that's, I haven't actually done, done a summary for today. That's, that's, that's my last page. So I hope it's been informative. I hope you've all learned something, even if not very much. And thank you very much for being a great audience and thanks for listening. Thank you. 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 I can see you all again now. Right. Well, thank you very much. I mean, uh, I, I hesitate, <laughs> hesitate to say that I learned a few things there, of course, but I don't think I've had a very um, sort of like a, um, a normal ringing upbringing. What I've learned has been very hard work <laughs> <laughs> and some of the things sort of passed me by. One of the things that, that did uh, strike a chord though was I remember that when I was first, well, when my first attempt at learning plain Bob Minor, which was, uh, well, some people here will know that it was a, a complete disaster. <laughs> uh, but the way that I was being taught was, being, was that pass two bells, pass the treble, pass another two and dodge with the next bell. And I, I do remember being taught that way. And maybe that's what, what maybe that didn't suit me because I was a total disaster for me when I, I learned. And, and actually I almost gave up ringing at that point. Mm. But uh, my, the person teaching me to read had the foresight to not push it and taught me grants instead. And I didn't mm. ring plain Bob, I didn't ring plain Bob in any form until I had learnt uh, surprise major method. Uh, and that was, so that, uh, but that's, I, I, I appreciate that's a, a very odd ringing up ringing, but I do remember that sort of thing. So, so if my story tells anything to people, it's is, is not, you know, all the things you try are not necessarily things that, yeah, that will suit you. Um, and um, you know, it's always worth maybe if you've been struggling with something for a long time, perhaps trying something else and going back to the the, the, uh, the thing you've been struggling with a, a, a long time afterwards. I I I, um, I was forced in the end to ring Plain Bob uh, Minor, I think it was, because I was helping out on a training course, and I remember John Anderson saying, "Right, bring the fourth to Plain Bob Minor." for somebody who was leaning it inside on the treble and I, I was thrown in at the deep end but but my my ringing experience from what I for the many years I've been ringing um, actually stood me in good stead and I was able to probably just apply some of the rules that that Phil had, um, had just outlined today and, and busk my way through so people's experiences of ringing are not always, I'm sure most people here can, can probably vouch for the fact that every, people's experiences of learning to ring are, are definitely not all the same. And for some, they can be quite, uh, you know, it can be quite a trial. Uh, and sometimes you need to find a different path. 
but, uh, but, but, but the, uh, the, the all the stuff that you've done today, yes, it, it can open up. Okay. You find the best way of learning for you. It gets open all those opportunities. So if, if anybody has any questions for Phil, uh, uh, please let's ask them now. Um, just, uh, just a thought, really, on, on like, um, you know, and you were, you were saying earlier, surprise uh, mm -hmm. is a treble method where you meet the treble in the method, you have to dodge, blah, blah. But um, I've seen a lot of, um, on some of the bell ringers Facebook groups, where they put that it's a little, little method of being added and might be worth much later on having a session of what all these terminologies are. So you can learn something more from that. Little, little, little methods, just as a quick one, I mean, little methods, You usually, again, there's no hard rule of thumb, but they usually imply the treble doesn't go all the way to the back. Mm. But I've seen stuff where it's, they've said, we've added a new method this week, and it's something or other, and then it goes little, little, little surprise. You know, it's, mm. there's loads of little bits of terminology. Mm. That's, I mean, uh, well, sorry. I was going to say, I mean, it, 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 what isn't actually helpful is I know for a fact I've referred to a couple of doubles, uh, of double methods, not doubles, but double methods like double court and double Oxford and the court mm. in the name mean that, you know, then, well, yes, you can flip it left to right and top to bottom. But there are other double methods out there which don't have the word double in their title. And in fact, Bristol and Superlative, two of the standard eight, they're double methods, but it's not in the name. Mm. So it doesn't always help. <laughs> Oh, okay. Okay. Sorry, Claire, thank I you. Would say. Well, uh, what I was going to say, uh, I was going to say thank you, Jane, for bringing that up because one of the things I was going to uh, would, would like to ask people, uh, particularly people who are, would be our students in in school, is are there any subjects that you would like us to cover? Uh, because we can uh, perhaps if you uh, could email me. Uh, at the school email if there's any subjects you would like to cover so that we can uh, try to get uh, get something uh, organised. Arthur's got his hand better. Can you fill in the form? I'll, um, I'll put the link in the chat box. Yeah, good. There's a, so Arthur has created a form, so uh, if you can fill that in if there is anything you would like to do. Um, to do uh, a, a presentation on. Uh, the, the thing about terminology, Jane, I think that um, it, it went, as soon as you said that, I thought, oh, yeah, uh, a, a presentation on ringing jargon would be really good. But I actually think that you you were talking at it as, at a slightly higher level than would be covered in learning the ropes. But that doesn't mean to say that we can't do it. I mean, we just need to understand what people want to, uh, what would like a presentation on. Mm. But also, I was thinking, like, because um, we, we just don't know how long this is going to go on for, um, maybe some sessions on ringing room for each of the levels so we can have a little practice at what we would have been doing if we were at the school itself to, to sort of continue thinking about it so we don't feel completely lost when we do actually come back. Jane, I think you must have been reading my mind. <laughs> <laughs> because one of the things I was just starting to discuss with Arthur whether it would be practical for us to get some ring room sessions uh, up and running. We've, we've, uh, we've, uh, Simon uh, has been running ringing room sessions for Brumdingers uh, and mm. they are, uh, they're, they're very successful. Um, now we've got the sort of formula right as to how many people, but it, we, we need it. It needs to be in small groups, uh, and I think that's something that I will get together with the uh, the tutors in the school and see what whether we can uh, arrange for uh, to uh, establish some ringing room sessions. If I could say, um, when I learned London, and it's interesting, London was on today. It taught me the importance of knowing which place you are in and relating to whether you are hand or backstroke. And that really improved my ringing a lot for a lot of methods. And I wish when people wrote out methods, they put hand and back uh, by each stroke, and then you'd know which way your dodges are going and which way your places work. And it does help, and it cuts out a lot of the counting of places. It just gives you a guide. Yeah, I agree completely on that. Well, Claire, 
yeah, yeah, so thank you, David um, and Steve. Susan? Uh, yeah, I have to go uh, to a meeting with yeah, Simon. Yeah, I think I'll be, I'll be joining you in a few minutes, so okay. I'll go, Susan. I'll Bye. see you later. Cheers, Susan. <laughs> Um, um, so, but, but, but the point about I would I would say though that people don't always the the point that David made uh, and and Steve and Phil were agreeing with about being you know learning about hand stroke and back stroke. All of my my entire ringing life, I've always sort of like known this, and people have said this to me. However, it's not always made sense to me, and a lot of things that we tell you in as you're as you're learning to ring. And for instance, this where you're passing the treble, you know, you, you pass the treble in three, four, etc. Some people uh, uh, don't panic if you can't see that. If people have told you that, but you can't see it because you're concentrating so hard on uh, on on staying on the line and making sure you get your, you know, you've remembered which dodge you've got to do and where to do it. Um, don't worry if you can't do that. The more and more practice you have. The, the, the you will eventually start to see that and it but there's no harm in us telling you this from uh, from the from the start because people see things at different times and, and people have different ways of of navigating their way through things so for some people it might be obvious that you know passing the treble here means i do this dodge here uh, and that's how some people ring it and i i would say from my own experience my ringing i changed from sticking to the line knowing when to dodge to ringing by passing the treble in simple methods like playing Bob and Grantson. And I put that down entirely to the, um, the amount of time I spent practicing. It. And, and so, so for me, I, you know, it sort of play spells went uh, sort of almost go out of the window because you just know if I pass the treble here, my next dodge is going to be uh, in three, four. Uh, and, that's, and that's what I was saying when I said about the doubles variations. So St. Simon, St. Martin's, as long as you know what that front work is in, your, in, your, uh, uh, in, in, in the method of variation then you, you, you're halfway there if you know that when you pass the treble in three, four, that you're going to do this dodge, or if when you pass the treble, uh, you know, in second space, you're going to make second. So, you're, you know, it makes your learning of your method a lot, a lot easier. But I wouldn't say, I think that for me, that was hard one, uh, but for some people it will come a lot easier. Um, this afternoon's meeting at three o'clock. Yes. I can't remember which email the link was for the... The Zoom link. I'll send it out again. I think I'll send it in a minute. Mm. Okay, thank you. Yeah, it just makes it easier for everybody. It's on the agenda, Jane. Well done, Stella. Efficient, <laughs> efficient secretary. And do we bring our own tea? Do, do we yes. do we bring our own tea? Yeah. Make sure you've got your Bake Off entry on show. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's eaten. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and mine too. Uh, Right, okay, so well, if, if, we're, if we're done then. Um, mm -hmm. Can I just ask, I'll just put the thing for the form in the chat, but 